Paul, so yes. um, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, yes, thank so, you. What's your topic of innovations from the past few years? It sounds like we're all having technical difficulties today. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Very yeah. good, very good. Uh, right, where do we start? So I've, I've listened to a lot of the other sessions today, and it's interesting, everyone's got their take on, on, uh, on innovation and, um, and technology and the adoption of technology. I, I firstly point out that, you know, I see, I've seen it from multiple angles. I'm, I, as, as James said, I'm, I'm part of the committee and, and a mentor for the Shape Climate Change, which is the first agri-tech accelerator um, or entrepreneur support uh, vehicle in the UK supporting early stage innovation, uh, predominantly coming out of universities. Uh, I'm also a mentor of the global accelerator Thrive um, and judging Africa and, and Australian innovation um, and also been involved in, in investment in early stage uh, technology for, for about 15 years. Uh, I'm also lucky enough to see it from the other side where I we have a family farm that's it's been in the family since 1042, so about 900 years now. Um, hopefully, we're not the ones to screw it up. And and I've also I've also been an active member of the CLA, which is a lobbying group supporting uh, and representing farmers uh, on all matters of policy. So so I so I've been lucky. I think I've been lucky enough to see it from the innovation angle uh, and from from what farmers are actually doing uh, day to day. And I think let's let's put the Let's put the farmer hat on, and I'd say, you know, when it comes to technology and innovation, it needs to do one of two things: either either needs to reduce cost, or it needs to significantly increase yield to uh, if if there's a behavioural change required. And and I guess the the comments that I've heard over the last uh, uh, during the other sessions is, you know, this this drive for precision ag. the the drive for new innovation technology, and, and let's just caveat, but let's just say, you know. Innovation in farming has been happening for thousands of years. It's not uh, it's not a new thing. Um, so, so I think we, firstly we should not refer to it as, as you know being this this new shiny thing where where only innovation is happening today. Um, you know, today's innovation. There's a lot of shiny and exciting pieces of innovation that are that, that we can see. So, you know, the data collection and 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 what we're doing with that data and analysis of data. Uh, urban ag or, or vertical farming or whatever you want to call it, gene editing and CRISPR, um, precision ag. Uh, it's, it's all uh, robotics. There was, there was another one from today. Uh, you know, th there's, there's a lot of talk around all of that. And, you're, and sound, you're sounding a bit jaded, Paul. I mean, what's the thing that's really sort of <coughs> caught your attention? I mean, you yeah. give us a list. Let, let's... let's uh, let, let me give an example. So, precision ag, for example, is is very exciting, and it's very exciting. It's been it's been in the market for twenty years. Uh, you know, Yara came out with the end sensor, reducing costs, so that ticks one of the boxes. Um, there are two hundred thousand or so farms in the UK. There's about two hundred and sixty end sensors in the UK. So, it's all about. I, I think you know, going back to innovation and, and technology. I think you know that technology is twenty years old. And it's only, we've only got 260 farmers using that technology out You're of You're rather confirming my, my <laughs> hypothesis that rolling this stuff out actually takes quite a bit of effort. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, think it's, I think the thing that I get most excited about is, is the innovation that has the, least, the, the requirement for the least amount of behavioral change. And, and we see that in innovation with GM and, and seed uh, uh, and and reduction in reduction in uh, sort of bio fertilizers and bio pesticides and and the uh, and finding technologies that farmers already do do the sort of thing that you would require to use that innovation day to day. So basically, and, the innovations you like are the ones where farmers don't have to do very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah or, easy, or, or, easy or or try and encourage or try and encourage greater adoption. And you could see you see financial inclusion, smallholder farmers, they're more willing to use uh, new financial tools. They're more willing to share data, and because of that, they're able to increase their yield significantly. They're able to to make huge leaps because they're they're, they're significantly more open. Um, well, I'm going to come I'm going to come on to data a bit later, but I'm going to move on a bit now, Paul, and just uh, uh, 
chat to the, to the others. Mark, you're more on the livestock side. What, what's the innovation you think that is really changing uh, that aspect of farming at the moment? Uh, I think you might be on mute. Uh, can you select your microphone at the bottom of the screen? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Let's go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the, I think Paul's absolutely right. Innovation's always been there, and that's a feature of farming. Um, the key thing that slows it down is poor signals, and I don't think subsidies help or data not flowing along the uh, supply chain. So getting those things right, farmers have a good history of responding to signals, so we just need to get those signals. In terms of what we've got now, the precision agriculture for the, for the large animals is one. We can now relatively easily identify individual animals, and with the internet of things and some sensors, we can actually say what that animal's doing and respond to how it is uh, performing as opposed to how the group of animals are performing. So that's one area. In terms of where uh, things are going at the moment, we've got these clever sensors and the Internet of Things allows them to put data up into the cloud. What we're really looking for is some smart systems to use those and produce some very um, simple metrics that make managing animals better. Finding out which animals aren't performing as well as they were last week, they might need attention in terms of health or something else. Um, which animals need to get uh, diverted off because it's time for mating for them if it was a dairy cow um, and which animals uh, have producing just about at the level you want for their final um, meat production so they'll be going off to the meat processor so i think precision agriculture is one area the other one is the ability to better manage animals in terms of 24 7 inputs so traditionally a good stock person would not be with the animals all 24 7 they've got other things to do and they have to rest themselves but the sensors can provide a rich environment of information that then feeds through to those decision support tools so i think data will be the one but uh, that's, that's sort of moving away from the way we traditionally see farmers they're always becoming data rather than going out and sitting with a bank of screens well no no i don't think so if it's a good system they won't need to do that so a good system will do some processing up in the cloud and there'll be just some alerts on their mobile phone in their pocket which says this particular cow or sheep needs looking at or if it's a poultry and pig situation you go and look at a particular pen um, or group of animals and it might say the audio um, trace we're getting from that group of um, chickens is suggesting that the animals are starting to feel hungry relative to other, other, other pens or there might be a health problem. So you can use audio, you can use imagery, you can use other sensors, gas sensors, that sort of thing, which all tell us about the environment the animal's in and how the animals are behaving. So it's basically having a, a, a more sets of eyes on what's happening. Wow. Oh, that sounds really impressive. Sam, thanks yeah. for joining us. Sorry, I think you're a little bit late there. Now, you work on uh, more sustainable approaches to crop protection, particularly integrated pest management. Can you tell us what that is and the kind of work that you're doing? Hey, well, I'm, yeah, I'm interested in developing integrated pest management strategies for farmers to control their internet pests in arable crops. Um, and we're really trying to reduce the insecticide use um, in food production. Um, so we're trying to um, integrated pest management is the use of various strategies, not just one control strategy, i.e. spray. So farmers are encouraged to monitor their crops to use cultivars that are resistant to pests um, to be able to use components of the combination of approaches. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. So we're trying to figure out um, the type of tools to monitor. I think that's one of the first things. Um, monitoring is that we know how to do it in the field any today. Can I just jump in? Can I just jump in? A little bit of audio interference on you there, Sam. Might, not, might need to be a bit closer to your microphone. Shall I try? Is that better? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> and, um, um, yeah, if, you all, if you've got your speakers um, too loud, we could be getting some feedback there. So Paul and Mark, make sure that the audio is I can, I can hear t feedback. Is that better? 
Yeah, I think we're okay now. Carry on, Sam. Okay, Sorry. I can't remember where I was now. Um, so, yeah, monitoring. We need better tools for monitoring to help farmers to really know when to spray so that they only spray when absolutely necessary. I think that's the first thing. And there aren't actually that many really good tools to help them to do that. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is to de to focus on delivery of alternatives um, and particularly the ecologically based alternatives. Um, strategies like reducing insect populations via habitat management, um, companion cropping, um, managing the, the crop environment or the, the boundaries of the crop to provide resources to promote biological control. These are the kind of things um, that we're trying to do. That's IPM. There is actually a requirement by the EU to for farmers to do IPM, that there's an actual legal requirement for us to do that, but it's very difficult for, yeah. for them to carry it out in practice um, because there aren't that many tools available. So the innovations that most excite me are the tools that are coming through now to help farmers to do integrated pest management and they include um, sensors to be able to detect insects as they fly into the crop to automatically identify what they are, um, where they are, and when they're there. I mean, I just think that's amazing, and I've been really privileged to be part of that development. Um, not all innovations are high tech. Um, and another innovation is the use of, of flower margins and the development of seed mi mixtures that can actually attract exactly the right types of natural enemies or pollinators that we need to increase food production and reduce pesticide use in our environment. Well, you've all mentioned data, but, but data is, is commercial information, right? This is something that farmers uh, may wish to hang on to. Now, I know, Sam, that you're involved with a project called EcoStack, which is trying to encourage data sharing, can you just tell us about that? And then I'll perhaps pick up with the, with uh, Paul and Mark about, about data sharing and how important that is. Yeah, okay, thanks. So EcoStack is an EU funded project um, and it's trying to well, stack ecological approaches to pest management and pollination and, to, and water services. So each stacking um, different strategies that provide ecosystem services um, on farms. Um, we're really interested in how um, the, the crop boundary of farms can um, support natural enemies that provide pest regulation services and pollination services to those croplands that are adjacent to them. Um, we know that at the edge of the fields, we often suffer yield decline. And what we really would like to try to look at is to see if these crop boundaries and the natural enemies that they support can try to mitigate that yield decline at the edge of the field. And for this, we need lots and lots and lots of GPS enabled yield data from farmers, advisors, um, and hopefully, you know, it will come out in the wash, but but we will we need loads of it. And, and we're really, you know, struggling actually to, to get enough uh, data to be able to, to, to carry this out. So we would, you know, plea for any farmers, advisors to, Please share your data with us. There's a link um, in the. Hello. Can help out with that. That'd be great. Paul, should farmers be sharing more data with each other? <laughs> this this is this is a this is a massive massive challenge. Uh, you know, as a consumer, we're all sharing data constantly. I mean, even farmers through sensors of their uh, tractor like sharing sharing data. Um, so I, I also say I'm involved with Yara and IBM's global initiative on an open data platform. We're working with the likes of CGIR, which is a billion dollar funded organization with, from Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the like. There's everyone sees data in a different way. There is no this concept of uh, in the Yara labs, there's 20 years of soil data from the UK, millions and millions of soil samples, no georeference location data because farmers and agronomists aren't willing to share it. Um, and I think this is this is part of the problem is that, you know, that there is what someone's view of, there was a question around quality, quality, sustainability, regenerative, what, what, what people's views on, on all of this, it's all different. So there's, there's very little standardization there's very little trust when it comes to data sharing. 
Uh, and there's very li- little evidence that, you know, the farm business survey run out of Cambridge is 2,600 farmers, very secretive, shares it with DEFRA, but doesn't, doesn't open it uh, out to the rest of, rest of the market because it's challenging. EU funded projects, like I'm, I'm, I'm guessing like Sam's with CGIR have the same challenge, is, is the restrictions on what they can and can't do with that data. Because sharing data is one thing, but are the farmers benefiting? How are they benefiting? Are they being financially rewarded? This is this is this is unlike most of the solutions out there don't give back directly to farmers. They're great pilots, but they don't have financial sustainable business models. Now, and, Mark, you've got a, uh, go I, I think that's a really good point, Paul. But Mark, you've got experience in other countries. Do other countries do this better than the UK? Um, I. I, I think there's initiatives in other countries we can look at, but I think we, we can easily do it well here. I agree with um, Paul about the issue of trust. In the previous job, I worked um, in the area of genetics with sheep breeders, and some people were very reluctant to let their data be analysed in combination with others. But after you've talked to them and shown them how that actually delivers extra value, because it shows how different their animals are, which they can then use in marketing, saying this particular sheep has got these attributes, um, that, that's a real advantage. There's people looking at this now, and the issue is about um, putting data where it can be accessed by other people, but you as the data um, owner grant permission to people, and you can do that when they deliver value to you as well as you delivering value to them. So. We, we're moving in that direction, and certainly in the genetics area, we've got a situation in this country where uh, people are sharing data across herds and across flocks, um, and that's a good area of showing where it can work. Just to come back to a point that Sam made about um, those field margins, we're starting to look at um, carbon capture and carbon sequestration, as it's called these days. We, we need to be thinking about hedgerows, woodlands, and these margins, because they're, they're not inert and, we, and we're not just focused on the crop, we need to be thinking about the whole landscape when it comes to some of our carbon and greenhouse gases, so it's a very important area, that area. Now, just picking up on that, that point about the field margins, you've all talked about the fact that if farmers see something is adding value, they will go for it, but a lot of the new sustainability we're talking about, that may not be adding value, making things more profitable. What kind of mechanisms do we need, you know, if we want zero carbon, Farming, if we want farmers to um, environment, how do we incentivize that a bit? I'm going to start with you. You go. James, you are really garbled back. <laughs> I think I got it a bit, James. In yeah. terms of how we put value on these other dimensions of, let's call yeah, exactly. it sustainability. It could be carbon capture, it could be um, richness of biodiversity in the landscape, which delivers some of those predators for the pests that Sam was talking about. It's a, it's a good question. We, we're actually driven by an economic system at the moment, which is how much does it cost and what's the return? And we need to be starting to think about what are these other value um, dimensions and possibly putting some sort of monetary equivalent on them. And I would expect that um, Farm support will be attempting to do that sort of thing coming forward. Well, um, the, if you're doing a good job to do with the environment, this is the reward you get in terms of the support from um, the, the government, which is effectively delivering value to us as a society. Sam, do you find farmers are keen to take up these innovations, even, if, even though they may not be particularly profitable, at least to start with? There's a wide, lots of farmers are taking up initiatives like field margins, growing flower-rich field margins, um, cover cropping, um, under-sowing their crops for a variety of reasons. Um, And those that do, you know, it's almost, you know, religious fervor (laughs) about it. Um, No no tilling, you know, zero tilling, that that kind of thing can have clear environmental benefits. But the reasons why why different farmers are taking them up vary enormously. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what in the uh, assist project, we were ha- trying to find um, farmers that would put field margins right in the middle of their crops and at the edges. And well, we thought that this would be a really difficult ask. 
and in some cases it was it was really hard to find far enough farm farmers that didn't have any of these landscape features that we could use you know one of their fields as a control so some farms we we weren't able to to work with because they they didn't have a control field without any of these features so i think there there is actually quite large uptake but the reasons behind that are varied and many but um but yeah, I think most farmers do see that you know increasing farmland biodiversity is a good thing. I think I think they're starting to feel a bit victimised by the insect decline lobby, um, and you know want to do something about it. And this is one way that they that, that they can do exactly that. And Paul, does the investment community play a role in pushing this sustainability agenda? I uh, absolutely. That's it's uh, it's the requirement. I think Mark mentioned earlier around around policy, um, policy and investment need to come together to be able to ensure that this happens. It's not one can't exist without the other. Unfortunately. And is anybody getting that right? Uh, well, I I think another thing that's come out of other sessions is is around the the importance of innovation technology being regional so I, I i mean we're talking about a uk context here but uh i mean farmers have been doing uh, have been looking after their land and looking after the environment in the uk uh, and we look at what's happening with the ag bill now it's you know the whole the british farmer and the values associated with the british farmer are very different to the us or brazil or other developing markets. And I, and I think that has to be taken into account. So, you know, we're a relatively small island and, and I'm sure a, a lot of farmers, as Sam has said, are, are already doing a lot of good work. Uh, and with a new Ag Bill and, and Elms coming out, there's going to be more focus on um, farming as a public good. Uh, the environmental uh, requirements are going to be, uh, are going to come out over the next sort of seven to 10 years. And, and, th and that has to be verified uh, and and I think we're doing all the right things, but you know, a trade a trade bill might completely screw that up. So we'll see. No, we're getting quite a lot of. We can't, we can't, we're expecting farmers to put these field margins in, but there is a there is a cost to that, and we are expecting them to bear that cost. And actually, that's not fair. You know, the public money for public goods is all you know is all very well, but that, let's make sure that 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 that's how it's being used and that farmers aren't actually having to fork out themselves for these services. I think that's really um, a key thing in, in moving forward with, with uptake. Now, I'd, I'd like to go to some of, we're getting quite a lot of questions and comments coming in. I'd like to go to, to a couple of these. So uh, this is from Joanne Cook. Even when we have the tools, is there a gap between the scientists who make the tech and the accessibility, ease of use and relevance to farmers? Mark. The gap from life to life. Yeah, the, 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 there is a gap because you, you might see the sensor technology leads the application um, technology, and that's where we're seeing a lot of work. Uh, uh, one bit, good example is that the um, Fitbit for cows, the ankle bracelet which some cows wear, which has got accelerometers in it, just like your Fitbit. When it was first brought out, they thought they could predict. Um, sort of from cow movement about cow health and then they discovered they could actually pick up lameness and then they discovered they could um, assess whether the animal was coming into estrus in which case you might be being put forward for artificial insemination so the richer the data sets the more the applications can grow um, I, I think you just need to be able to get this blend of people who understand animal behavior and animal biology in touch with the people who are generating the data and, and then you've suddenly you can you'd be cooking with gas what about what about farmers as scientists themselves this is there ways that we can actually make the farmer be an, an experimenter in their own right it, in my experiment the, the you get some farmers who are extremely demanding of science saying that it's not working you need to sort this out i'll make my farm and my resources available to you so those farmers are a joy to work with, and uh, we would encourage it. I found farmers a joy to work with as well. I've, I'm, I'm glad to say I've been working with farmers, you know, since well, 2008 in my first DEFRA project. And um, we've got to the point where, as scientists at Rothamsted, we can only take the science so far on 
is that better with my speakers? Sorry, I can hear from the back. Um, uh, the most exciting part. Speakers line, that will help. Now I can't hear you. <laughs> um, is that better? I can hear you fine. Okay, we can only take the the science so far on our experimental farm at Rothamsted. We can do experiments in very controlled conditions with controlled balance neighbour effects. But then when you scale that up to a real life situation, you need 20, 30 replicates of these things and it becomes extremely expensive and it's just not possible to do it in a research sense. So we need farmers to, to participate in our, in our trials and... Um, yeah, that's where they they are driving the science forward because they know how practical it is and how to make it work better, how to optimise the system. So I think there's a massive role for farmers moving forward in science. So Mark, and then I'll come to Paul. Uh, yeah, just to briefly to add to that, we're involved in a project with Rothamsted and their farm at Northwick um, and the AFB, which is the uh, Agricultural Research group in Belfast, Northern Ireland, we've set up um, weather stations on farms across the country and the farmers walk across their farm and uh, estimate the um, volume of grass using what's called a plate meter and that's creating a network of data and those farmers are really keen, they want to manage the grass better, they want to get greater utilisation and the network provides quite a, a, a good um, set of data in field on farm. So those sorts of initiatives and getting people of some of the crop protection work, putting up some of those sensors that pick up the flight of, of um, insects and things. For And when I say crops, I mean pasture as well as, as um, arable crops. There's some really exciting times here. So, Paul, um, it's often said, fairly or unfair, that farmers are averse to risk because if you, if you try a different innovation, if you do experiment, you are taking a bit of a gamble on your crop. Can can we create an environment that underwrites that risk through the investment ecosystem? It almost sounds as though you you've you planted these questions before the uh, or you came up with these questions before the actual session because I think that that is that is crucial. Um, a, a good innovations, the best innovations happen when they're co-created. You can't you can't just come up with a, an innovation because there's a wonderful grant. To, uh, that's associated with it. There, there needs to be discussions with farmers and food producers at the very early stage, and, and, and innovation needs to come out of those discussions. There needs to be a lot more market uh, discovery. Um, and, and I'm going to answer two. I'm going to answer that question. We're also referring to a, a point that John Harrington's made on the uh, uh, on the Q and A, which uh, as a Canadian farmer. So are there innovations out there reducing risk? And there, there is actually one which is a Canadian company uh, called Farmer's Edge. And what they do is they actually use data uh, and they use precision ag to uh, encourage farmers to, to, to uh, they effectively provide financing and insurance products for farmers that are looking to do better farming. So it's it's not as though they're not being encouraged to fail. They're not being encouraged to to just take subsidies because of the amount of land they have. They're being they're they're being paid or they have access to capital because they are looking to be better farmers and they're proving that they're being better farmers. And we need to have we need to have more of that. We need to have financing and insurance. And I'll make I'll just make one one more point. It's about the smallholder market, smallholder finance is a $450 billion hole. Only 10% of smallholder farmers globally can access enough capital to be to even have the option to be innovative. UK farmers can, can access an overdraft today, but smallholder farmers, only 10% of them. So if we don't provide financing and we don't provide the, the, um, the security to adopt innovation and co-create co with science, then, then we're failing. So can I just introduce a, another element here? So we're talking about farming as if it's just another industry, uh, but actually it's not. It's part of our culture, and uh, farmers can be extremely emotionally attached to, to their land, to their livestock, uh, to the way they farm, the way their farm looks. Do you think we actually pay enough attention to that emotional side of farming, uh, to the way that, that both 
consumers regard farming and the farmers themselves regard farming. Sam. Sorry, I'm reading Margaret's. Margaret. Right, well, <laughs> I'm going to get some more questions, but. Uh, uh, you... I'm, I'm just going back to co-creation. Um, there is a big move. Margaret Gill um, said that she, she totally agrees that we need to discuss with farmers at the start. Um, and, and talks about an initiative in New Zealand that's called a national challenge um, where research has to be co-created, co-designed and co-implemented. And actually, that, that is the way things are going um, here too in the UK and in the EU. In our EU project, EcoStack, you know, we are, we are co-designing these strategies from the bottom up and we're moving them and the farmers are involved in the, the, the um, strategy board. It's almost it's going to go now. Well, I do think, I, I, I mean, again, a lot can of I, can I it, actually. Um, uh, we've got uh, talking about initiatives to try to de risk. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a funding strategy in the UK called Farming that Rotten said and AHGB are interested in, uh, or funding and farmers that have got an idea for, for innovation or a research idea that they want to can can apply for funding to tight, you know, de-risk it a little bit, um, link up with a researcher, and then that researcher works with the farmer to, to investigate that particular idea. And I think this is one example of the, these co-innovation ideas that, that, that you know, we, we need more of. Well, we're hearing, you know, we're hearing constantly about more pressure being put on farmers to be ecologically friendly, to, but to be profitable. And then we're, we're getting stories about you know issues around mental health um you know we we can't really just see farming as as just another business can we mark i i, I you're absolutely right there because it's basically it feeds people and it's and as you say it's a very um strong part of our culture food security and uh, food quality food safety are all things that we value very much and we need to need to make sure they are high on the agenda. If you go back to triple bottom lining of people, profit and planet, we've got to feed our people. We've got to look after um, their needs in terms of that and the environment and what, how they value it. We need to look after the environment itself just because we've got to sustain farming and not progressively deplete the uh, natural environment. And in terms of business, it's, it's the profit. We need to start thinking about profit in, in other dimensions, not just the what the, um, you see on the bottom of a an accountant's books. So I think we'll get there. But you made a point about um, of farmers and innovation. I don't, I can't think of a, an innovation on farm that didn't have farmers involved. They, they they have to be. I like very much the idea that Maggie Hill said about the fact that you um, need to involve them from the start. And and a lot of the ones I know of. The farmers initiated it and brought the scientists to 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 the um them in the certainly in the area of genetics and some of the other issues to do with um uh, fertility of, of soil and things like that. So farmers are a part of the solution. Uh, we need to get some good signals and we need farmers to be rewarded for delivering the values that the um, society is putting on the place they work and for the product they work with and produce. I mean, you're talking about signals there, but. There's this tension, isn't there, between the business, the, the industry, as far you know, as farming is often seen as, and then what people actually want to find a more natural approach. Uh, you know, we've had the soil association come up in in the, in the chat there. Uh, how, I mean, is is that tension ever resolvable? The fact that people want farms to look like they look in children's books, and yet sometimes you know, we have to build an ugly shed. Uh, uh, in order for innovation to happen? I, I certainly think it's possible to move in that direction. And I think the um, people like the soil probably have a very realistic view of what farming should look like, whereas some of those picture books may have not such a realistic view. Um, it's pretty hard to sell a book full of pictures and driving um, rain from the north and you're trying to get sheep into a shed because they're lambing. Um, but at the same time, those dramatic pictures tell you what farming's like for farmers. Paul, um, you've been talking a bit about, about other systems. Where, where in the world do you think uh, people are, are 
are getting this right? Where is the ecosystem around farming and innovation really beginning to make a difference? Uh, good question. I think I think you see you see a lot of innovation that's hap happening out of places like New Zealand and Australia and and the U.S. Predominantly because I mean, New Zealand out of uh, out of necessity because of the subsidy removal in a, in a relatively short amount of time. Places like Australia and, and the U.S., where there's uh, where, where farming and agriculture has such a significant impact on on GDP, uh, and also they they it's a it's a very I guess it's it's sort of baked into the culture and and I think when you've got an industry that is so important to a country, you really look to drive it forward. There are other examples like uh, what we've seen over uh, over the last twelve months in the Middle East. I mean, Israel has 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 a phenomenal innovation ecosystem generally, just because they need to. You know, they, they have very little land mass. They have uh, they, they have they they don't have a lot of resources. So it comes down to supporting the people to innovate, and and the government, and investors, and the ecosystem has has gone out to do that. So you see a lot of innovation, not just in agriculture, but but generally in Israel. Uh, and then the adoption of uh, of technology in in other countries is is driving innovation a lot faster because of the necessity. I mean, Dubai uh, Dubai has has ramped up uh, water desalination and vertical farming and use of technologies so that they can uh, be self sufficient. Qatar, when when uh, when they had the um, uh, the challenges with their neighbours effectively created one of the biggest dairies in the world overnight by flying cows in over on on, on aircraft you know it's, 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 it's necessity that drives innovation and and you see some of the best innovations some of the most valuable innovations having come out of global recessions and global downturns and i think, I think we're seeing yeah, that i think that's a very important point there paul about policy and in crop protection sam Policy is a real driver of change, and I'm thinking particularly of the way the pesticides are, are ruled in or out. How is that affecting what you do? Massively. Um, um, yeah, when I started, I started to try to reduce pesticides in, in, in pollen beetles uh, management in orseed rape. Um, farmers weren't interested because they could just spray pyrethroids and the problem was over. When pyrethroid resistance in pollen beetles came along, they, it was a complete game changer. Farmers were phoning me up saying, what can we do? What can we do? Whereas before, nobody was interested. All of a sudden, funding streams became available to, to find alternatives. And now we're seeing um, pesticide revocation by, by the EU. So the loss of neonicotinoids in, in all seed rape seed treatments is now driving a cabbage stem flea beetle problem. So we're seeing policy, it, it, it's, it's massive. And things like, poly, you know, if in Denmark, they have a pesticide tax, which makes farmers think very carefully about, about what products they apply to their fields. Um, yeah, uh, you can see it in many different ways and, it, and it's massive. And George Eustace's talk on Monday, you know, it's going to be very interesting um, and might end up driving this need that we're seeing um, and the ability and the... the, the the, the willingness of farmers to take up these new initiatives and, and wildlife friendly farming is, is a thing now. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it and it's going to be done better. Well, Mark, I guess in livestock and I know this thing would be antibiotic resistance. Is that dry? Well, and, and, antibiotic resistance is, is definitely um, looming its head. I know from um, my experience in the sheep industry, the sheep industry have had resistance to the drugs for internal parasites uh, for quite a while. And uh, some of the farmers and breeders have put a lot of effort to selecting sheep that are either resistant or what they call resilient. And so therefore those pests, are, uh, those pests internal parasites, have less effect. So you, there's a variety of ways you can tackle it, but I think you're right about policy is likely to be dictating things. Um, I'm interested in the pesticide tax that Sam talked about. That's a really interesting idea. Check it out in Denmark. They have. It. I'm not saying we should have it here, but it's it yeah. it's, it works. <laughs> if it's a dangerous pollutant, you can understand why they do it. 
Yeah, and I noticed that we're seeing more and more uh, flea treatments for pets now being implicated in uh, river pollution here. So uh, these issues are, are arising across the board, I think. But unique pressures, I think, on farmers in particular, in, in uh, you know, particularly in the current environment with the pandemic, where we, you know, food supply and supply chains have been uh, really highlighted as being absolutely vital. Do you think innovation is going to respond to what we've gone through with COVID? Uh, let me start with Paul. Uh, I think I think innovation, well, innovation is responding all, all over, but it's, it's more around who's doing something with that innovation. And I think uh, with, with, with greater pressures on the, uh, on a sector, especially agriculture, but we can also look at Brexit and the Ag Bill also, uh, you know, you've got this perfect storm. And I really wouldn't go through this without mentioning Brexit. Well, I'm certainly, I'm certainly, I'm certainly, discussion about talking about. drives innovation. And if you don't know what you're not allowed to use tomorrow, you're going to very quickly re think about, you know, what do you, how do you need to future-proof yourself? And I think right. that's what's driving it. So just, just very quickly, Mark, um, uh, changes as a result of what we've been through? Uh, well, I know um, farmers who are running their businesses well already have health protocols which involve quarantine stock that come onto the farm, that sort of thing. COVID's sharpened our focus on those sorts of things, and we realise how important it is, and I would hope that that will see sort of a, a more general um, pick-up of that across um, the country. And uh, apart from that, it's about how, how do we cope when we don't have treatments, and so antibiotics and antibiotic resistance is a bigger problem now that we know how important those sorts of treatments are. And Sam, your work's very much about resilience. Yeah, uh, well, I would say as COVID though, people are going outside and if they live close to farms, farmers are getting a lot of foot traffic on their on their footpaths right now. And I think this has really increased um, the, the recreational um, side of, of farmland. Um, I think that's going to, to be a big thing moving forward. People want to use farmland for recreation and farmers will respond to that requirement um, in, in, in a way that will make the, the countryside look pretty. But maybe that can also tie in well with the carbon capture thing. So what you were saying about farm, farming not being a way of life is, is, is going to really play out in the future um, well, and, and uh, change yeah. our food and landscape. I'm going to have to leave it there. Thank you all very, very much indeed. That was... Uh, Absolutely fascinating. Far too short, of course. Uh, the next Rothamsted session is at two when we're going to talk about delivering on the promise of GM crops. That's another main session in the session uh, agenda. Do please join us for that. Uh, my name is James Clark. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for joining us. Thank you.